Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the BSF webinar on myths and facts on fungicide resistance. We're glad to have you join us here this morning. Hopefully, all of your preparations for spring are well underway, and I know probably some of you have even hit the field in parts of uh, southern Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. My name is Sean Haney, founder of realagriculture.com and host of Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147 on Sirius XM. I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. Joining us today is Colleen Redlick. She is the Technical Marketing Specialist for Fungicides with BSF Canada, based out of Saskatchewan. Kelly Turkington is the plant, a plant pathologist with uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, based out of Lacombe. And uh, also rounding out the panel will be Dwayne Rathman. He is Technical Service Representative for BSF USA, based out of Southern Minnesota. So we've got a bit of a North American flair here for you here today. You know, with the range of experts from Western Canada, the United States, we hope to gain a well-rounded perspective from our discussion on fungicide resistance today. We hear a lot about herbicide resistance, but what about fungicide resistance? BSF is committed to helping growers adopt management strategies that contribute to healthy crops and minimizing disease and, and fungicide resistance issues. That's why for the first time ever, we're devoting an entire webinar to discussing fungicide resistance. Today, our experts will cover a broad range of fungicide resistance topics. We'll start by promoting awareness around what it is and the challenges it raises for growers. We'll look at the differences between herbicide resistance and fungicide resistance, because there are some. One of our experts will offer insights on a fungicide resistance case study from the US on sugar beets, and we will walk through practices to combat disease and best management practices back here in Canada. We'd like to end the webinar today with time to answer your questions. The Q&A is always uh, my favorite part of any of these BSF webinars that I've hosted. To submit a question, just type it in the chat box and will appear on the screen at the end of our discussion. We'll have our experts answer them during the Q&A period at the end of the program. And be sure to put your location in there. It gives, a, it gives the panelists some, some context of, of where you are coming from. Also, for those of you who are certified crop advisors or certified crop science consultants, you'll receive one CEU credit for attending this webinar. If you've registered at an earlier date or forgot to include your numbers when you signed in today, be sure to contact Ag Solutions Customer Care at 877-371-BSF. That's 877-371-2273. Our first speaker is Colleen Redlick. She is the Technical Marketing Specialist for Fungicides with BSF Canada. She grew up on a family farm in Bigger, Saskatchewan, and has a master's degree in weed science and a bachelor's degree in agronomy. Her previous role with BSF as a Technical Service Specialist in West Central Saskatchewan, where she worked directly with sales reps and customers and supported the Field Scale Trial Program. Colleen, I'll hand it over to you for your presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Sean. Um, well, I think probably, you know, that's a, a great introduction and, and looking at that, some of you are probably wondering why uh, BSF has a, a weed science uh, major speaking on, on fungicide resistance here. But, you know, I think this is actually a really great tie in with the topic I've been asked to cover today. And, and I think it'll be a good introduction for everybody. So, you know, if you're like me, probably when, when you hear um, the, the term pesticide resistance, what you're thinking of is, is more related to herbicides, just as that's really been what we've dealt with more here in, in Western Canada. Oh, nice, there we go. So yeah, when we, when we think about pesticide resistance, these are probably the, the usual suspects that come to mind, right? We've got our, our kochia, our cleavers, our water hemp. Um, for most of us as, as growers and agronomists, this is kind of what we've had to deal with in the field. So I think, you know, how does that really relate to fungicide resistance? There's a lot of lessons that we can learn about uh, dealing with, with these resistant weeds that, that we can apply to fungicides as well. So, you know, really a lot of similarities and things we need to intuitively understand in order to manage this risk are the same whether we're dealing with herbicides uh, or fungicides. So when we think about the overall resistance risk, you know, there's there's a lot of things we need to understand. So first of all, being our pests. So whether it's the weed species we're dealing with or, or the pathogen, the disease, uh, the chemistry that we're applying and how that's gonna impact the selection for, for resistance. So whether it be a herbicide or a fungicide, there's some characteristics about the chemistry that we need to understand. And finally, likely what's gonna be most intuitive to most of us on the call, the agronomic factors. So we really do have the opportunity to change our risk level, change this conversation um, around what we have with, with fungicide resistance 
by understanding our agronomics. So I think that's a great uh, lead in and that's uh, you know some of the things that we're going to look at in this talk today. So when we talk about myths and facts, um, probably the first myth that, that we often have to bust out in the field is you know, how, how resistance occurs in the first place and what resistance really is. So conceptually, I think this is really very similar, whether we're talking about herbicides or fungicides. And we also hear kind of the same misconceptions sometimes um, when we're talking to growers. You know, sometimes there's uh, the idea that really spraying a, a pesticide on a pest is what causes it to mutate and, and become resistant. And that's not really true at all. What, what happens is we have these naturally occurring individuals who, who you know, have the ability to survive application of, of a pesticide and are resistant at a very low um, proportion of the population. So when we apply a pesticide, whether it's a, a herbicide or a fungicide, what we're really doing is just selecting for these resistant individuals. We're not creating them. So you can see in the diagram on the bottom, you know, we start out with that very low level of naturally occurring resistant individuals. And by continuing to select for them, what we are doing is shifting the population to you know, a predominantly resistant population. So practically speaking for us as, as growers and agronomists, that's when we start to have the problems, right? Because we're not getting the desired effect out of our, our pesticide product anymore once we shift that population to resistance. So I think, um, you know, when we, we know this, we know that uh, we probably need to understand a little bit about the chemistry we're applying and how it's going to impact that shift in the population. So you were all given the opportunity to ask a, a question or enter a question when you registered for this webinar. And one really common one that kept coming up was, you know, I understand the herbicide groups and the resistance risks that they might carry with them, but is there this type of relationship with fungicides? Is this information known and can you share something about that? So I think that's a really good place to kind of start this discussion here because um, it's a really good point, right? We're probably, a lot of us are familiar with this triangle. Um, this is from Dr. Hugh Becky's work and certainly if you uh, farm or you're an agronomist in, in Western Canada, definitely this is very prominently featured in our uh, guide to crop protection, right? So most of us have a bit of a, a base level knowledge when it comes to herbicides. We know that there's some herbicide um, mode of action groups, the group ones and group twos, that are considered high risk for resistance. And we know that there are some that you know, are, are a lot lower. So the, the four, sixes, nines, tens. And I think that really can impact, you know, how we utilize these herbicides and, um, you know, our, our level of concern and, and how we um, use them out in the field. So this is really important to understand that this does in fact exist for, for fungicides as well and a really good place to start here. So uh, when it comes to fungicides, there, there are, uh, you know, organizations who have developed this type of information and probably the key one is FRAC, the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. So FRAC is made up of a body of, you know, leading industry scientists and they've come up with, you know, some of this great information um, to, to let growers agronomists know what the risk levels are for these different fungicide groups. So the, the FRAC code or the numbers, um, that's a lot like herbicides, it's grouped by, you know, um, similar site of actions. And then they've rated the resistance risk based on you know, the, the factors of these different mode of action groups. So it looks like there's a lot uh, of groups on here, but when we actually start talking about the ones that we use commonly in Western Canada, really there aren't that many. So you know, very few at the bottom here are rated as a low risk. Those are multi-sites, typically older uh, fungicides considered to be a little bit less efficacious, and we're not using those that much anymore, um, certainly not here on the prairies and in our field crops. So when it comes to, you know, the important groups that, that we are using, it really comes down to three, the group threes, sevens, and elevens. So we'll go through these in a little more detail here. So the first one we want to talk about is the group threes. So you'd all be familiar with, with these group three products, um, pretty common, commonly ones, commonly used ones in the field, things like Caramba, your tilts, your pro lines of the world. And we've also started to see these in a lot more mixtures. So, you know, as the industry is, is looking at resistance risk and uh, looking at, at ways to, to minimize that with mixture products, these are really good ones that make up the backbone of a lot of those mixtures because they are our lowest uh, risk of, you know, the three that we're using. So considered a medium risk by, by FRAC. The second group is a little bit of a newer group. Um, certainly here in Western Canada, we're, we're seeing more and more of these all the time. Uh, these are the group seven. So you might hear these referred to as the carboxamides or the SDHI inhibitors. Uh, so these are things like boscolid, and also again, components in a, in a lot of these great mixture products that we're using. So things like Cotegra, Diax, Preaxer, um, Syngenta's Moravis brands, all based on this SDHI chemistry. 
So these are uh, considered medium, sometimes listed as medium to high risk by, by FRAC. And finally, our last group we'll talk about uh, that we commonly use are the group 11. So you might hear these referred to as the strobilurins or the strobies. Um, these are things like headline, quadris, um, and you'll see them in a lot of mixtures now. And really that's no accident. I know for, for BSF and a lot of the other players in the industry, seeing that these are a high risk um, fungicide group is, has really led to you know, putting them in a lot more mixtures to reduce that level of risk for our growers. So I think this is important to, to understand that these groups are grouped by mode of action and we do see some differences in the resistance risk. So, you know, if we like Dr. Becky's triangle and we want to, to use that to think about fungicides, we certainly can, but we maybe start to see here why Kelly and his, his pathologist colleagues didn't, didn't need to do this, right? There's not a lot of groups on here. That's probably the number one thing that, that jumps out to me. Um, not, not a ton of groups and really not a lot in this lower resistance um, category. So it's really probably should, should be intuitive to us. It's vital to know what groups you're applying and really look at ways that we can minimize the risk that we're applying to some of these higher risk groups. So the group 11 specifically, maybe those sevens, by you know, combining, uh, using some of these premixes, are alternating with other fungicide groups to take some of the pressure off of those higher risk groups. So I think now that we understand a little bit more about the chemistry, you know, the next thing is really that target pest. So whether it's herbicides or fungicides, really important to understand a bit about that pest that we're trying to control. So as a weed scientist, I think this is one of the, the biggest key differences when we talk about fungicide and herbicide resistance management. When we talk about weeds, you know, we know they're going to be present every year. You think about, you know, a weed that you're maybe concerned about resistance developing, something like a wild oat, it's going to develop that persistent seed bank and regardless of what crop you have there, you're going to have to deal with those wild oats year in and year out and, and be thinking about, you know, how you're managing um, your, your herbicide groups. Fungicides are a, a little bit different, right? So the disease does require a susceptible host for that selection pressure to be there and occur. So if you think about a crop rotation, if you're concerned about maybe resistance in sclerotinia and canola and you rotate into wheat, you know, wheat isn't going to be hosting that, that sclerotinia pathogen like canola. So you're able to kind of break things up a bit more with, with crop rotation. But that being said, you know, even though maybe we don't have that selection pressure every year, it is still good to understand the pathogen and some of these risk factors. So FRAC also has, has a list that classifies the pathogens based on their risk. And some of the factors that they take into consideration, so you can think about these when you're thinking about your target pathogen, things like the reproduction method. So does it have a sexual cycle in there that's going to you know, increase the, the risk for resistance? The number of generations per year, so certainly something that's, that's monocyclic will have a lower risk than, than a polycyclic where you have multiple cycles of, of that infection each year. Uh, the level of spore production, the range of spore dispersal. So, uh, you know, a, a pathogen that produces a lot of spores and they can be windblown and, and travel very far, that's going to have a, a higher risk associated with it. The ability of the pathogen to overwinter may come into play. So things like rust that maybe don't overwinter here in Western Canada, uh, we can be a little bit less uh, on our toes about just for that reason. Uh, also the relative fitness of a pathogen after resistance. So typically where we see resistant issues, that mutation that leads to um, you know, the resistant individuals and, and we're selecting for doesn't lead to a, a decrease in the fitness. So those individuals are, are just as able to uh, you know, survive and, and reproduce as, as their non-resistant counterparts. And also we can look at a little bit at the resistant history worldwide. So you know, Kelly's got a lot of great information about this and what he's seen in his career. So looking to you know, what's in the published work and, and what we've seen. So, Maybe lower risk, we haven't seen as much resistance development in diseases like rust or fusarium head blight versus something like ascochyta blight or botrytis, where there's just been a lot more global cases of resistance developing to those pathogens. So I'm a person who, who likes examples, and we'll give a couple of examples that maybe you guys can relate to from you know, Canada and what we've seen out in the field. So I think you know, for, for most of us as weed scientists, the, the poster child for um, resistance is, is really kochia, right? So when we think about kochia, it, it gives good ideas of how understanding, you know, these, these resistance factors can give you some clues into how concerned you need to be about resistance. So kochia, something with very diverse populations, highly outcrossing, 
Um, it has, you know, that great dispersal mechanism. I think everybody from Saskatchewan has probably, you know, been been chased down Highway 7 by a, a kochia tumbleweed, so we know it's spreading its seed that that far and wide. Um, and just, you know, when you combine that type of weed or that type of pest with a group 2 herbicide, we know that those group 2s, they're a lot like the group 11 fungicides in that they're a very high-risk mode of action. They're something that's very efficacious, exerts a strong selection pressure when uh, the target pest is susceptible to them, but they also carry with it a very, you know, high risk of, of um, resistance developing. So those group two herbicides really were used frequently across multiple crops. That uh, kochia was there every year, and it only took three generations before resistance was found to kochia. So, you know, in this situation, really, we now consider uh, all kochia in Western Canada to be group two resistant just because of how you know strong these these factors selected for that resistance so when we think about you know an example to relate it to with fungicide resistance i think first and foremost luckily there aren't very many right so we don't have a ton of very serious resistant um, diseases in, in in western canada certainly but one that maybe some of us can relate to is ascochyta blight and chickpea so with ascochyta you know we think about that pathogen a lot like kochia, it, it had, you know, high genetic diversity, very good dispersal mechanisms, so produces spores that are wind-borne, so they can, they can spread very easily. It is a polycyclic disease, so, you know, those multiple cycles being selected each, each season. And we had growers, you know, with chickpeas being a high-value crop, being very susceptible to diseases, they were spraying sometimes three to five times per season, so very strong um, selection pressure with that. When you couple that with our group 11 fungicides, which you mentioned have some parallels to those group two herbicides, carrying with them that higher risk of resistance. So again, not surprising that with this one, um, short number of years, we were basically able to, to confirm resistance and the group 11 fungicides really no longer considered uh, effective on that ascochyta and chickpeas. So it doesn't mean that they're never applied, but certainly our, our producers have had to think a lot about you know, very strategically deploying them and, and using them in mixtures with fungicides that, that are impactful on this disease. So I think, you know, once we understand a little more about the pathogen, um, the fungicide, that's really how we can maybe direct how uh, we want to adjust our agronomics, right? So agronomics really, I think for most of us, the most intuitive piece here and the number one thing that we can control on, on our farms. And the good news is a lot of these same best practices that you already know uh, from herbicide resistance management really do apply to fungicide resistance. So I think everybody gets a little bit sick of seeing these IPM slides. Um, you know, we've, we've seen them quite a bit. and It's because this is just really great uh, general information for managing on the farm. So I'm not going to belabor, you know, these points too much because literally when you look at the, the body of work of, of the next speaker, Kelly Turkington, and some of his co-authors, the... Uh, we literally have the guy that wrote the book on this coming up next to, to talk about uh, how some of these things can be used in Western Canada. But really, you know, everything from the start of the year with your variety selection, your crop rotation, uh, quality seed, and, and through into where you start using your fungicides, making sure you're using those two or more effective uh, mode of actions in the tank are rotating your mode of actions if those mixtures aren't possible. So, you know, even though we're doing all these great IPM tactics, there is uh, often still a need to, to apply a fungicide for disease management. We want to make sure we're growing healthy crops and, and shooting for a good return on investment on these crops. So I think first and foremost, you know, you want to be out scouting. You want to make sure that this application is warranted. Avoid any of that recreational spraying that, uh, you know, is really just selecting for resistance and is, is not going to give you a, a good benefit from a fungicide. But that said, it, once you've decided to pull the trigger, decided to apply that fungicide, there's a few things that we can do to just help reduce our resistance risk. So first of all, applying preventatively. So getting out before, you know, you're seeing a lot of that symptomology in the field um, is great before that, uh, that disease pressure gets too high. So very important with group 11 fungicides particularly because they are so strong preventatively. So you really want to be um, on top of managing that disease. We want to apply it labeled commercial rates of our fungicides. So this is a very important point with FRAC. Um, you know, here in Western Canada, we saw a lot of splitting, doing like a half rate of, of a group 11 fungicide with herbicide timing and then coming back in with another application of a group 11. You know, we really want to avoid those type of, of off-label type applications. Um, spray coverage is a huge one. You know, making sure you're, you're adjusting your methods, you have everything tuned in so that you can 
maintain those high water volumes, get good contact and have good efficacy. And this one, uh, I, I'll put my hand up. I'm probably bad at this on the, my own family farm. We do a lot of scouting from the swather or the combine, right? And go, oh yeah, I, I don't know if that, that worked out that well. Um, this really is not a great time to be you know, scouting for fungicide efficacy. You really do wanna be out there in that period where the fungicide is having a, um, efficacy and having impact. So it's usually about 10 to 14 days after application, we like to say go out and, and assess efficacy because you know, when you call later in the season, it becomes very hard for, for anyone to understand um, and help you with, with a fungicide inquiry. And speaking of fungicide inquiries, I will say my career as VSF, I have been called out to a few of these. Typically what we find, these are not related to fungicide resistance. So, you know, there, there certainly are the occasional case of fungicide resistance, but much, much more commonly, these are the result of things like incorrect disease ID, incorrect product selection. So not picking a product that's labeled for the diseases you're concerned about, issues with application timing or methodology. So potentially spraying too late and there's already a, a heavy amount of disease in that field or, uh, you know, not getting good coverage. And sometimes we see those environmental conditions that just encourage later disease development, right? So you get about 10 to 14 days of protection out of that fungicide. If there are these persistent conditions for disease, you may need a follow-up spray. And finally, I'll, I'll leave it here before we pass off to, to Kelly and Dwayne, but I think the take home message is a great thing. Fungicide resistance, we can learn a lot from herbicide resistance, but they are not the same. Uh, when we look at herbicide resistance in, in Western Canada, and I think most of the world, we've been really reactionary. So we see resistance develop and then have to work together to, to come up with a solution. I think, you know, having calls like this and having this many people interested is, is awesome. And it really shows that we have the opportunity to be largely preventative when we talk about fungicide resistance in Canada. We really haven't seen fungicides, you know, they've, they've been increasingly used on, on more acres, but still relatively small compared to herbicides. So we don't have huge issues with, with resistance developing yet. So I think we have great opportunities to learn uh, less and lessons from herbicide resistance and uh, good transition. We have great opportunities to learn from our next two speakers. So that's all for me and we'll see you at the Q&A. And of course, if you have any questions for Colleen, I encourage you to put them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Great stuff. Appreciate it, Colleen, very much. Uh, Kelly Turkington is our next presenter and will be sharing from his expertise as a plant pathologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lacombe, Alberta. He has a PhD and a master's degree in plant pathology and having spent many summers on his father's grain farm near St. Bruce, Saskatchewan, Kelly brings close to 40 years of experience in integrated disease and crop management research. As Colleen said, he wrote the book. Here is Kelly Turkington. Kelly, you're up. Well, thank you very much for those kind words, uh, Sean and Colleen. Uh, I have to acknowledge, though, I've had a lot of excellent mentors over the years, so it, it, it's been that uh, opportunity that's really helped me as far as uh, shaping where I'm at as far as disease management and so on. So this morning, what we'd like to do is to give you a, a quick and, and uh, a, a quick overview of fungicide resistance from a prairie perspective. Uh, and I am just waiting for the slides to advance. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about the experience here in the prairies. Uh, and uh, I'll call on a, a bit of my own experience, especially lately, working with a grad student at the U of A. Now, before I get into the talk, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the colleagues that I work with, uh, the funding agencies that uh, we have the uh, opportunity to access and who are very generous, and of course, the organizers of the event today. So if we look at disease management, Colleen had talked about the disease triangle, uh, and it's something that pathologists hold dear, and it really symbolizes what disease is all about. So you have a, uh, a susceptible host, you have a favorable environment, and you have a virulent pathogen in sufficient quantity. And you need all three factors to interact to produce disease. Now, if you look at a, a producer, uh, what they're doing uh, in terms of managing disease is manipulating one of these three components. And certainly the many strategies related to the host and pathogen, there's a few related to the environment, especially if you're a producer under uh, irrigation. Now, if we look at uh, managing the pathogen, one of the traditional or foundational strategies that can be used to manage the pathogen is simply crop rotation. So you, you avoid growing a particular host crop 
too frequently in your rotation sequence. Ideally, at least two years between host crops. Unfortunately, there are many factors that will shape or influence a producer's cropping uh, decisions uh, in terms of economics and other factors. So across the prairie region, in many cases, we see the typical rotation being a canola, cereal canola rotation, or in some areas it might be Durham wheat pulse crop, Durham wheat pulse crop rotation. So that single year between host crops is not sufficient enough to really derive a, a lot of benefit from, from crop rotation. So this means that we need to look at other tools to manage disease risk. And the next big tool that we have access to is host resistance. And it's an excellent tool uh, when you have it in the variety that you're, you're growing. Unfortunately, depending on your end use market, uh, your, your region, uh, the varieties that perform well in that region, the variety that you ultimately choose may not have a complete disease resistance package. So that means that you're not necessarily accessing all of the benefits of rotation. The variety you're growing is maybe so, uh, not quite a complete suite of resistance. So the next strategy that we have that is, is a key strategy, and we see it more and more over the last five to, to 15 years is the use of fungicide. So tight rotation, a susceptible variety, no worries. I'll just spray it with fungicide and I'll manage my issues. It's a bit sim simplistic and, and there, are another, there are a number of factors that you need to keep in mind. And today we're gonna talk about uh, factors related to the risk of fungicide resistance. So if we look at the history of this, and if you go back into the literature, really, uh, we started to see issues with fungicide resistance, not necessarily in field crops, perhaps in some horticultural or vegetable, vegetable crops in Europe and the UK back in uh, probably 30 to 40 years ago. 30 years ago, we started to see issues in terms of some of the main field crop diseases in cereals, canola, and so on. And uh, certainly in Europe, the reliance on fungicides it tends to be a bit bit heavier, and as a consequence, they've seen uh, some real issues with fungicide resistance that it's that has developed. Uh, I like to think of Australia as being the canary in the coal mine, and and uh, Colleen talked about being uh, reacting to an issue rather than maybe being proactive. So for Western Canadian producers, we have the ability to be proactive in terms of managing risk. So we can look at what's happened in Europe. We can now look at what's happening in Australia. And they're seeing multiple issues with resistance in a range of their, their main field crop uh, disease issues. So uh, speckled leaf blotch or septoria triticae in wheat, uh, net form, net blotch and barley and so on. So we're behind Australia in many sense, uh, sense and in a good way. So if we look at Western Canada and we go back to the mid eighties when I was a grad student at that time, our fungicide options were really quite limited. A few key products depending on the particular crop you were looking at or disease issue. So they were quite limited much like as you can see in the picture here, short length. Now, if we look at, um, at uh, just advance here, so we look at the options at that time, very limited. You know, there were a few triazoles that came on stream towards the end of the 80s. We had things like Bravo or chlorothalonil that was being used in the early to mid 80s for ascochyta in uh, lentils and so on. There were certainly some seed treatments, products like Benelate and Sclerotinia and canola and so on, but pretty limited. If we fast forward now to 2020 or 2021 now, uh, we have uh, an increase in the options. So certainly some of the SDHIs, some of the newer products we see, the strobilurin class, and of course the triazoles, which tend to be the workhorse uh, in terms of managing field crop disease issues in Western Canada. So if we look at the occurrence of fungicide resistance and the history of it, and we'll go through this really quickly, that some of the first cases occurred in terms of Benelate or Benamil, which was a product being used for sclerotinia and canola. And Bruce Gosen and others, uh, Ron Howard, found uh, uh, some cases of resistance. Now, Benelate or Benamil is no longer in the market. 
Uh, fast forward to probably the, the early 2000s, we saw the introduction of the strobilurin class of fungicides in Western Canada. Uh, they were much improved compared to things like chlorothalonil or Bravo, but unfortunately they were used uh, uh, probably multiple times during the growing season, certainly at least one, if not two or three times, and they're a particular class of fungicides that are at high risk. Recently, we've done some work with the U of A and a grad student, Ali Reza Akavan, looking at the net blotch pathogen, both the spot and net form of that net blotch pathogen. And we've seen some issues with uh, propiconazole and pyroclostrobin. And then there are other issues in terms of uh, some storage rots and potatoes, but we won't go into that in a lot of detail today. So very quickly, if we look at the work that we recently did in terms of net blotch, we found some net form net blotch isolates in central Alberta that uh, we characterized as being insensitive to uh, propiconazole. So one of the older triazole chemistries, and recently over the last 10 to 15 years, it's been used uh, typically at that herbicide timing. And quite frankly, I'm not a big fan of that timing, but uh, we'll leave that for another uh, webinar. Uh, we also have the spot form of net blotch. We had an isolate from Saskatchewan that had uh, insensitivity to pyroclostrobin, so headline. Unfortunately, this was also an isolate that appeared to have uh, some uh, reduced sensitivity to propiconazole, so a triazole. So we are starting to see some indications. Now, this is uh, in the lab, and typically in these cases, we wouldn't have seen an issue in terms of field performance yet for that fungicide. So really the identification of these isolates of the net blotch pathogen really indicate uh, a pressing need to look at managing the fungicides that we have. And we'll talk about that uh, here uh, in the next little while. So Colleen's gone through and provided some great detail in terms of some of the strategies, the risk factors and so on. I'm just gonna give you a really quick overview of some of the strategies and whether they increase the risk of fungicide resistance or decrease it. So increasing your fungicide dose, definitely wanna avoid that. So use the label recommendations uh, in the guides to crop protection that you have. Uh, increasing the number of applications. So simply repeated use, especially within a growing season, definitely will increase your risk. It's something you want to avoid. Alternating acti active ingredients. And it's a bit of a question mark here. Certainly it is a strategy to consider, uh, but probably the biggest factor is using a product that is comprised of more than one active ingredient. So ideally two, three, and some of the products we see in the market now we actually have four active ingredients. So definitely an important strategy when you're looking at your fungicide choice. Splitting doses, and this is really equivalent to reducing ro uh, rates, you wanna try to avoid that. That is another factor that could increase your risk of, of fungicide resistance. And earlier sprays, uh, is a bit of a, a, a variability there. I would still say, especially in the cereal leaf spots, avoid that early application at the herbicide timing. Target it at flag leaf or slightly before, and then coming back in after head emergence to top up your leaf disease control and, and try and get some FHB suppression. So just to, to, to bring things home here, and again, uh, Colleen talked about uh, integrated uh, uh, disease management or pest management practices. I would definitely say, based on my experience with our research and working with people like George Clayton and Neil Harker, and now Brianne Tideman and Hiroshi Kubota and other colleagues across the prairies, this is a key uh, strategy and a key thing to, to consider. So first of all, as part of this integrated approach, you really need to know what you're dealing with. And you also need to know what you've used in the past as far as the fungicide products that you have. And this needs to be done on a field by field basis. You need to look at the resource information that you have. You need to look at field scouting and Colleen touched on that. That's an excellent strategy to determine whether you have a risk, especially for things like the cereal leaf spot diseases or perhaps some of the foliar issues and pulse crops. And then for things like Fusarium head blight or sclerotinia, some of the weather-based maps and others, other tools will help you to gauge risk and the need to apply a fungicide. So be prudent in terms of your fungicide use and only use it when you actually need it. Uh, the next thing is really to, overall to optimize crop health. And this may not 
prevent disease from happening, but by using good agronomics, good fertility, uh, and a good variety with the best resistance package possible, looking at your seed health, these will all promote a crop that is healthier and perhaps better able to tolerate uh, a particular disease issue. But if we look at some of the other strategies, crop rotation and addition of diversity, so if we're looking at things like intercropping perhaps or cover cropping, that may be something to consider. One thing that we want to look at is volunteer and weed host management. And uh, in, uh, that, again, is something that could potentially mitigate or, or sort of reduce the effectiveness of, of crop rotation in terms of disease management. Uh, next, we want to, so really what you're looking at here is disrupting the pathogen life cycle. Uh, so in terms of long-term consistent management of multiple crop health issues, uh, there are really no magic bullets uh, to address all crop health concerns. It's a combination of strategies using integrated crop and pest management. It gives you that opportunity to deal with multiple issues. It's very important in terms of prolonging the, the effectiveness of the sources of resistance in the varieties that we, we use. Uh, and also it's very important in terms of lowering the risk of fungicide uh, resistance development. So the ultimate goal really in terms of these strategies and implementing them is to limit the pathogen's ability to reproduce and produce that genetic variability that can create these uh, uh, members of that pathogen population that might carry the genetics that confer resistance to a particular fungicide group. Uh, so with that, I'll end there and I'll pass the torch back to Sean. Hey, great stuff, Kelly. Uh, really do appreciate it. Uh, fantastic information and a nice picture of the short shorts. That, that's, that's going <laughs> back. What's old is new again, Kelly. You, you still, break those, still break those out? Uh, but not really. More okay. cargo shorts now. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. There, there's more pockets. It's handier. Absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Our final presenter has worked as a technical service representative with BSF USA in southern Minnesota for 21 years. Having grown up on a farm in Minnesota, Dwayne Rathman brings an American perspective to the topic of fungicide resistance, as well as over 40 years of experience in product development and research with expertise in weed and disease management. And similar to herbicide resistance, uh, news and information travels north uh, in, in this case as well. So, uh, Dwayne, I'll pass it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Tha Sean, and uh, good morning, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, at least a snapshot of what we've seen with regard to fungicide resistance, in this case, to Cicospora leaf spot and sugar beets uh, in the U.S. So, I am based in Minnesota, in southern Minnesota, and as as you may know, sugar beet production is is pretty heavy through the Red River Valley of North Dakota and Minnesota and down through southern Minnesota where I'm located. In fact, I think we produce about two thirds of the U.S. sugar uh, sugar beets in, in those areas with a number of different uh, companies, plants and co-ops uh, producing those beets. So we've had a lot of experience uh, with uh, everything that, that we've talked about here so far. Uh, Sacospora leaf spot, I think, though, is, is our poster child, like maybe kosha is for you in, in weed resistance management. And uh, I can show you a little bit about, you know, what we've seen so far. So on the next slide, I guess I just want to introduce the goals I would like to cover today. And number one, uh, I'll go through the timeline of Sacospora leaf spot resistance to fungicides in the U.S. And, you know, I'll be basing that on that North Dakota, Minnesota focus where, where I work. Uh, and then which is important as, as discussed by the previous two speakers, we really have to understand the practices that lead the resistance so we can come up with practices that, that help solve the resistance issues. Uh, and then I'll, we'll talk about how the, how the growers and industry have adapted to manage resistance and we have managed it. Uh, the photo you see on this slide is actually a, a, a field plot from this past summer. And this is what Sacospora leaf spot can do. This is an untreated check with no fungicides uh, down in southern Minnesota. And uh, as, as we call it, these, these sugar beets have melted down. So Sacospora is one of those diseases, uh, you know, analogy, analogy to uh, kochia, you know, highly prolific, a number of generations per season, uh, you know, just all those things that make a disease 
uh, more problematic and more more susceptible to to having resistance develop to it uh, to fungicides. So on the on the next slide, we'll talk about the timeline of resistance to Sacospora leaf spot in the U.S. And I'll take a little time on this slide because there's a lot of similarities on on what's been talked about. Uh, there's really only three or four modes of action or sites of action of fungicides that we have to use on Sacospora that have a activity on Sacospora leaf spot. First, in the yellow, uh, there's the group we call the multi-sites. And I think as uh, Colleen had stated, the multi-sites have been around for a while. They're all probably 30, 40 years old. That doesn't make them bad, but they're really just, they're less efficacious. They're, they're not as effective. But as you'll see, especially in our case in Sacospora resistance management, they're still highly important, even though they maybe aren't the the super active products that we that we'd like to have, they still serve a great role. And the other important thing about these groups in the yellow is if you see on the right, the resistance risk. The resistance risk to these multi-site fungicides is very low. In fact, I'm not aware of any resistance uh, to at least the diethyl carbamates and copper uh, in any any disease at this point. So they're they're a nice fallback, and they're as you'll see, they're really our key to tank mixing. Uh, to protect our more active products. And so the more active products are on the next uh, set of lines. And that's the, uh, on the pre, if we go back to the previous slide, thank you, sorry. So those are the single site mode of action fungicides. And quite interesting, Benamil or Benlate, really the same history as uh, Kelly talked about with his experience in uh, canola. Benlate was used for many years for Sacospora used heavily, used exclusively, and in about 1981, we had widespread benlate resistance and uh, practical failures of, of the beet production industry in my area, uh, very, very serious. So actually, uh, Benamil is out, it's no longer used. That resistance uh, does not you know, reverse itself or come back, and uh, so benlate is not used. However, Thiophanic methyl or topsin is still a key to use. It has a high level of resistance risk, as you see, but can be very effective because the one thing we've learned about it with regard to the cosper is that if you don't use it for a while or don't use it heavily, that resistance can reverse itself. And so it's still a key to use in conjunction with their other products. And then the next uh, line, the uh, orange line, the triphenyl tins, or people call them tins, super tin is a common trade name, uh, have a medium risk. So they're a good standby. Yes, there's resistance to tins as well. But as you see, when we alternate and use these products very selectively uh, year to year, uh, we can make them all contribute to an entire program. And as uh, I think as uh, Colleen stated, one of the backbones, uh, for Sacospora as well are the azoles or triazoles. And we have a, about four or five different active ingredient triazoles registered in sugar beets for Sacospora. Uh, you'll see they're rated as a medium risk. We do have resistance to all these uh, triazoles or azoles, but they're not total resistance. And the interesting thing about this group of chemistry is we've learned they're not the same either. For instance, a uh, Sacospora isolate that may be resistant to the first triazole listed there, tetraconazole, uh, may not be resistant to another triazole. So even though they're all triazoles, they're all group threes, uh, they're not all the same. And we find a lot of benefit in actually rotating this group of triazoles. And, and one of our common practices and, and recommendations is never to use the same triazole twice in the same year. How, even though we use up to six, and in, in uh, challenging years, up to eight applications per season of fungicides. Uh, so we actually rotate fungicides and within the trials all group, we rotate those. And we just have better overall management if we do that. And that's gonna be a disease by disease issue. So understanding your disease, understanding the crop uh, is gonna be important as to see how the trials all fit for you, any of your disease issues. And then the last line are the strobilurins. And a uh, really similar story as, as, uh, as uh, you have seen with some uses is that highly, highly effective product. However, once it gets used uh, 
it gets used heavily and after three to four years resistance can develop and unfortunately this has a high level of uh, resistance risk and that resistance is not reversible so once you have strobe resistance you always have it uh, with the mutations that we have seen uh, we just can't reverse that so strobilions really aren't used anymore for Sacospora so of, of the list of products you see there on the list that we've gone through it's the Benamil and uh, and the strobilians that are no longer used but the other products listed are our tools today to manage resistance so let's take a look at uh, resistance on the next slide and the practices that tend to lead to a resistance occurring. First of all, as many have stated, it's all about selection pressure. You know, the more selection pressure you put on that disease, the more chance you have of finding that one mutation uh, that is, is, uh, is able to avoid uh, control by a particular fungicide. So the first thing we see is that the high inoculum load, high disease pressure is, is in those years really where resistance can develop more quickly. And there's a number of ways to, to reduce that inoculum load, uh, but certainly sugar beet varieties that were planted with Sacospora sent, uh, susceptibility uh, in the early years, they were planted because the, they also had a high sugar value or high sugar yield. And unfortunately, they came with that penalty of not being as good on handling Sacospora. So that's one of the practices that led to resistance developing, just not the best use of varieties as we look back. Uh, and then, as always, over-reliance on a single mode of action, uh, whether it was Benamil in the early 80s, whether it was Strobilurins in the 90s, when they're used and overused, you'll develop resistance very fast. And then other things, uh, as a spray application effectiveness not optimized. We found out a lot of things about getting better activity out of these fungicides, just a matter of, of uh, a volume of water, of droplet size, of pressure, and, and timing. So with that, we'll go to the next slide, looking at, uh, looking at how the growers and the industry have adapted to better manage resistance. And so going back to our discussion on cultural practices and crop rotation, uh, the one thing that we certainly do now is we never plant sugar beets uh, in a field uh, more frequently than a, in a four-year rotation. And that's a challenge for the sugar, our sugar beet industry because as a sugar beet producer, you, you own shares in a co-op. And part of your obligation when you own shares in a co-op is you produce so many acres of sugar beets per year. So you can't take a year off from that crop. You always have to grow a certain number of acres of that crop each year. So that really has forced our growers to make sure they have enough acres in their farming operation uh, available so that they can rotate uh, and, and still produce a certain number of acres of sugar beets each year. So for instance, if you own 250 shares or 250 acres worth, you need a minimum you know, of, of 1,000 acres uh, in order to make that work in a four-year rotation. And then seed selection, uh, a lot more Emphasis has been placed on better seed selection, even though those early varieties uh, had poor Sacospora tolerance ratings because they had higher sugar. We've come a long way now, and, and those higher sugar uh, varieties now have better Sacospora tolerance. And then taking it up a few notches, uh, just released uh, in 2021, we have what we're calling the high Sacospora tolerant varieties, much higher Sacospora tolerance than we've ever seen. In most cases, our recommended varieties have been rated uh, a four or five on a, on a one to 10 scale with, uh, with the uh, low number being better or more resistant to Sacospora. These new Sacospora varieties uh, are in, rated between one, two, and three, depending on the variety. So they're much, much better than we've seen before. However, we have to be careful with these varieties because we know that if we apply a lot of selection pressure to these varieties, that is, don't do anything else, uh, you know, don't use a good regime of fungicides, don't rotate, that we can have resistance developed to these varieties as well. So it's another great tool, but it's not a silver bullet. And then with regard to fungicide use, uh, certainly as, a, as, as with all diseases, we really have to understand that pathogen. So we monitor the level of resistance or the sensitivity testing that we do every year to see what's going on in the field. So in each production area, we sample over 
a hundred different fields uh, with Sacospora on those leaves. And we send those to North Dakota State, to Dr. Gary Secor, and he gives us a level of sensitivity uh, so we know what's happening with each fungicide program is is it increasing or is it decreasing from year to year and it, it is field to field many times but it helps us design the program for the next year do we need to change things uh, is there one fungicide that we need to take out of the rotation for a while or or things like that so that really helps us understand the pathogen the other thing is we've started what we call an earlier first spray. We, we started what we call a timing zero. Even though we've traditionally done about six spray timings per year, we've added this timing zero, which is a week or two earlier or, or before timing one. And it's all about knocking down that disease to keep it at low levels because with diseases, you can never play catch up, right? You you really have to be proactive. You You can't, you can't try to catch it after it's developed on a plant. So uh, we found that by knocking that disease down uh, really helps uh, the spray program. So we call it the zero timing program where everyone goes on earlier than even our models have told us to go on in the past. And then we do tighter spray schedules. So traditionally with fungicides in the earlier years, we were spraying every 14 or 21 days. Now uh, we're spraying more commonly on a 10 day interval. So really, Again, keeping that inoculum down, making sure it doesn't have a chance to develop it in higher levels in the plant. And then with regard to rotation, that's been talked about, rotation of fungicides. We definitely rotate fungicide mode of action. Any mode of action through the isolate testing that's proven that it has value, we will rotate to those during the season with a six spray program. And then and in the case of the triazoles, we rotate that chemistry as well, never using the same brand name, never using the same active ingredient triazole in any, in any one year twice. And finally, uh, what we've really found important is the tank mix strategy. We never use a product alone. We always tank mix. Even though some of our tank mixes are those old standby products that are less efficacious, they still really help and they kind of protect that new, more, more efficacious fungicide. So two effective modes of action with each treatment is really what we're doing with fungicide use. So on the next slide, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, a successful program. And this is just my final slide looking at what we can do uh, and, and where, we've, where we've been and where we are today. So again, the untreated check is a slide I started out with, uh, and that's where we use no fungicide. And even though, most of the fungicides in this spray program I'm showing you on the right with the zero spray in the only case where we use a product alone. After that, it's always tank mix and will always rotate. So you can see uh, treatment one is a triazole and it's triazole one or, or active ingredient number one plus a protected EBDC. Then we go to a tin and an EBDC. And then we go to a, a different triazole and an EBDC and so on. And so that's the rotation we use. And even though you could say there's resistance to almost all those products in that list, what you see down below is our recommended program from this past summer. And we have, we have perfect disease control. Even though uh, in every case you say there's kinks in the armor and these products aren't working as good as they did if they use alone, yes, that's true. But if, if we use them in the rotation and very carefully with the tank mixes, uh, we, we have very good results. So I guess that's the good news. It can be managed. We've had bumps in the road, but it can be managed. And this is our successful program today. It doesn't mean it's going to stay the same. We will always monitor disease and see what's changing and adjust the, pr the program if necessary. But the recommended program you see below delivers uh, great sugar yields and uh, uses the tools we have today. So with that, Sean, I think I'm going to turn it back over to you. Maybe we have some time for questions. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Dwayne. Really appreciate it. I love getting the perspective from other geographies so that we can apply some of the learnings and, and bring them back home. So great stuff. I really appreciate you giving that presentation. Okay, so it's Q&A time. So if you do have a question, please enter it in the chat or in the question box. Uh, please do that and uh, also reference where you are from. Uh, some, some questions that were submitted ahead of time. Uh, did we lose Colleen? Because I don't see her on there. 
Okay, we'll just we'll jump ahead here. Uh, Dwayne, question for you: What are my options if I do have fungicide resistance on my farm? Is there anything that I can do to prevent fungicide resistance from happening? Yes, uh, certainly the goal is to is to keep resistance from happening completely. Uh, if if it does start happening, then we go to the strategies we, we talked about. Uh, but certainly, uh, everything you can do from cultural practices, you know, remember that disease triangle. So so can you can you change the, the host? Can you can you have a year where you don't have that 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 susceptible host? Can you can you knock the the uh, uh, inoculum load down or the disease down? Uh, and then uh, you know can you use other other tactics as well? Can you use a fungicide? Uh, even maybe just one application in our case, uh, if under low pressures, would still be used. So absolutely, you can you can manage it. You can't always control it, but uh, the, the principles are the same, and it's it's a great it's a great place to be in when you don't have to you know attack a big problem, but just keep it at bay. And that would really be the goal of a disease management if you can. Okay, uh, Colleen, question for you: Are some fungicides more likely to develop resistance than others? We heard about the experience with Benlate earlier. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think we we covered that a bit in in my talk there when you know we talked about the different groups. So I think that's a great place to start, right? When we look at the the frac codes and and how frac has assigned risk. So when we look at you know those those single target site uh, fungicides. The group 11s having the highest risk for uh, for resistance to develop, followed by the sevens, followed by the threes, and and those multi sites, those you know Bravo type products being the lowest. So that's really important to understand. I love that question because you know you you don't want to use those uh, those high resistance risk ones on their own. So Dwayne talked a little bit about it already in his answer, making sure we're tank mixing. So having multiple mode of actions in, in the tank effective on the disease you're trying to control is going to be the best way to reduce that risk when you look at the different site of actions. Okay, great. Uh, question for Kelly here. If using a strobe-based seed treatment and strobe in-crop fungicide, does it have an overall negative impact? Oh, that's a good question. And, and it's something that we've thought about over the last uh, several years because, you, you know, you look at some of the seed treatments, they have some of the same actives that are included in some of the foliar products. Uh, I guess the key thing would be uh, whether that strobe is alone or it's packaged as part of a, a mixture uh, with that seed treatment and then also in crop. So if you're looking at the seed treatment and you've got uh, maybe a, a triazole uh, partner in there, you've got an SDHI partner, your in crop might be a combination of a triazole and, and that SDHI, or sorry, that, that, that strobe. I think that would go a long way to mitigate some of the risk. If you were strictly looking at a single active based on a strobe learn on the seed treatment, uh, if it was something that was fairly mobile, that's another aspect that you need to think about. So it's moving from the seedling up into the foliage, so the first true leaf, the second true leaf, and then you came back in and used the same uh, uh, strobilurin-based fungicide, that would be your, your worst case scenario. It would definitely uh, two selection events and you'd be using a high risk fungicide alone uh, and that would be definitely a concern but I think if you look at the products on the market now you've got a, a, a range of seed treatments with a, a range of, of actives and we're seeing that more and more now over the last five to ten years with our end crops so going from a single to maybe two active ingredients to three and in some cases even four. Yeah, Duane we're talking about you know crops here where somebody may apply a fungicide once in the year this has got to be something that the fruit and vegetable industry is really paying attention to because they're they may be in every week for for a couple months uh, that they, they've got to be even more concerned about fungicide resistance well certainly the, the more applications that are needed the more selection pressure you're going to apply for a particular fungicide so so you, you definitely want to want to be more careful as you as you apply more selection pressure. Uh, Colleen, do we have you back with audio? Or are you there? No, I think Colleen froze. Okay. Uh, question here, Kelly. Uh, it's from Glenn. It's been two really dry years in our area in Yorkton. Would the pathogen levels drop off quite a bit? 
um, they haven't been seeing any fusarium in the wheat and only found one canola plant that had some issues. Mm. Um, do, does the years of no disease, does, does that have any impact on the pathogen load? Uh, it's an excellent question. I, you know, maybe if you had a series of five years with little disease, but the, the thing to keep in mind is that within the crop canopy, you might have somewhat of a different microenvironment down in the crop canopy, which may still promote a bit of leaf disease development. Let's say it's in cereals. So you might have some net blotch or scald in barley or spot blotch in barley or septoria in, in wheat that develops on those lower leaves. But because of the dry conditions, it really doesn't you know, the pathogen doesn't reproduce. You don't get production of spores and dispersal up onto the middle and the upper part of the canopy. So that's a thing to keep in mind. And it also is, is reflective of the, the particular pathogen. Uh, a lot of these pathogens are polycyclic. So the, the ascochytes in the pulse crops, uh, circospora in terms of what Dwayne was talking about, uh, the cereal leaf spot complex in, in wheat and barley are all polycyclic pathogen. So you can start with a relatively small amount of inoculum on your residue from a previous year. But if you have a susceptible variety and you have weather conditions that are very favorable, that pathogen can cycle every, probably every seven to 14 days, depending on the pathogen. So it can build up quite rapidly. So uh, I, I would say it's important, not, you know, not to assume that you don't have a risk and uh, especially for the cereal leaf spots, I like you can follow the disease in the crops. You're out at weed scouting, you see symptoms, that serves an, as an indication of an emerging risk. Check as you get into stem elongation towards flag leaf, assess that risk again, make the decision to spray. And then of course, after head emergence, you've got the FHB uh, aspect, and then you wanna top up your leaf disease control too. So uh, scouting is a, a key thing. So Previous years, if they've been dry, there might be limited disease. It may not necessarily uh, result in a reduced risk in subsequent growing seasons. Okay, great stuff. Um, Colleen, do we have you? I sure hope so. I keep yeah. freezing. <laughs> You're there. Okay. So there's a question in the chat. There's a couple that are following this line, and I had this written down as one of my questions too, is sort of like, this thin sort of line here. So it was mentioned a couple times to only use fungicides if absolutely necessary. This is kind of counter to what some of the companies like BSF have promoted in the past. Your story has always been that we producers need to apply them proactively as a preventative measure for disease control. Uh, how do you balance this out? Like, how do you how do you cross that line where all of a sudden you're overusing and you're uh, creating resistance? Yeah, so I think there's a, an important distinction sometimes between, you know, sometimes my sales reps even ask me this, they say, well, preventative, but then we're saying, you know, don't apply if not necessary. Like, I think as as BSF, and I'm sure as most of the, the major chemical companies, we want producers to have a positive experience with our products. And we know that that positive experience is going to come when there's a need for the products, right? When they see a benefit, when they see an ROI. So there's a difference between applying a fungicide, you know, just recreationally with, with no chance of success on, you know, a very dry year. I think I, I was cutting out on, on audio, but I think I just heard Kelly speak to it, you know, like you want to be out scouting, make sure that there is potential for disease. Um, you know, that that's a bit of a different thing to me than applying something preventatively, right? So, you know, we none of us have a crystal ball. I think last year, you know, I was, it, it looked like a great sclerotinia year. We were telling a lot of growers to spray and then it got incredibly hot, dry and windy right after, right? We can't always predict exactly what the risk is going to be. We know with fungicides, you need to get in there preventatively because they're not going to be eradicative in, in any cases that we have in Western Canada or cure what you see. Um, but that said, I don't think any of the companies are promoting spraying on a, on a crop that's, you know, not, doesn't have the yield potential, doesn't have the potential and the environmental conditions don't look conducive for disease to develop. That's really not what, what any of us want. So it is just that, that very, to use your words, fine line distinction between, you know, applying preventatively and, and applying kind of recreationally with, with no hopes of ROI or disease there to control. Okay, great stuff. Uh, Kelly, question here. If we are planning a two fungicide application program on malt barley, will early first application help keep background fungi levels down? 
Certainly. So, you know, in the case of a lot of the work that we've done with malting barley, uh, we haven't seen much, if any, benefit with that a half rate of, let's say, a, a propiconazole at, at herbicide timing. However, as the crop gets into stem elongation and you start seeing the third leaf from the head, the second leaf from the head uh, in barley, those are the two key leaves that need protection. Uh, you could look at at gauging the risk at that point, and then uh, going in with a, a product uh, that has a maybe a different triazol active versus what you might be looking at for an FHB application uh, is is mixed with maybe the the strobilurin class, and then uh, go back it. So that'll certainly help to limit leaf disease development and maintain the health of those upper canopy leaves. The challenge is that if you delay, so let's say you see disease developing at herbicide timing, you go back in towards uh, flag leaf emergence or maybe when the penultimate leaf is coming out uh, and uh, you think, oh, I'll wait until head emergence. But if there's a significant amount of disease, by waiting to head emergence, that pathogen's going to move up that crop onto the third leaf, onto the, the second leaf, onto the flag leaf, and then wheat, the flag leaf, is one of the key leaves. And by the time you get to that herbicide timing, you already have a, a fair bit of disease established in the upper canopy. So you're still going to see a benefit of that uh, head emergence timing, but the combination of that earlier application sometime between maybe growth stage 32 and 39, and then coming back in later on after head emergence for your FHB suppression and topping up that leaf disease control. Because the key thing is that period from anthesis to late milk to early dough, that's the key time for grain filling in malting barley and in wheat or feed barley. And you know the idea is that you wanna prolong that protection of that leaf tissue uh, as long as possible towards, you know, during that grain filling period. So I would look at what risk is developing earlier. Uh, if there's a significant level of disease you're seeing in the lower canopy, it's moving into the middle canopy. I might go in with, with an application at that stage and then come back in at anthesis to top that leaf disease uh, suppression or control up and then put on that product again that provides some suppression for FHB. Great stuff. Uh, question here for Dwayne. I'm going to butcher this active. So just, I apologize to everybody. You mentioned that if triazoles are not used for a period of time, they have the ability to reverse resistance. Can you go into more detail about your experience with this? Sure. Well, I, I think uh, uh, Colleen talked about this, the fitness of, of, you know, so if you're talking about a resistant um, uh, disease pathogen, uh, as as Colleen said, that means it, it had mutated at one time, and uh, you know, does that mutation have any uh, fitness penalty? So, does it overwinter uh, less? Uh, does you know, it, does it produce less? Does it does it cycle less? Uh, what we're finding is some diseases uh, can mutate, and 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 there's no stopping them. There's no there's no no fitness penalty, but some some diseases can mutate, uh, and uh, and they have some issues with them in that over time they just they can't survive like the like the original isolate could so they actually uh, dwindle in in numbers in the field over time so if you uh, selectively stay away from that particular chemistry for a while and you know take that selection pressure off that particular mutation will not go away but at least be a much much less consequence in a field where you know where you can start introducing that same fungicide again in future years okay um there's a question here in terms of rate cutting uh and does that w w similar to weed resistance does that increase the chance of of resistance i i think of remember the old days, Kelly, with tilt, where people would do a half rate of tilt yes. uh, as an early application. Can you speak about cutting rates on fungicides? You know, if you look at the FRAC guidelines uh, and you look at some of the information, it's a, there's a, it's a bit uh, of a mixed bag, but I think in general, um, cutting rates uh, allows for a, a larger proportion of that pathogen population to survive and reproduce which means that you have an increased risk of selection pressure on that pathogen population 
for members of the population that have that resistance. Uh, in terms of cutting rates, it would probably be more of an issue for the triazole class of fungicides versus the strobilurins. The strobilurins, it's such a specific target within the, the pathogen that any alteration of that target, that uh, pathogen will shift from being fully sensitive to fully insensitive. So in terms of the strobilurin class of fungicides, cutting rates is probably not as important. Uh, in terms of the triazole class and the pathogens you're targeting with that, uh, often there's a sequential shift from being fully sensitive to a little bit of a reduction. And over time, and especially where you use that triazole repeatedly between growing seasons and especially within a growing season, you'll see that shift to, to, to members of that pathogen population that uh, you're starting to see a product performance issue within the field. So yeah, the, the half rate part, I definitely from, from uh, my dad's point of view, you know, excellent way of cutting my my input costs right use a half rate uh certainly i know in the past with sclerotinia and the work that robin morell did we were looking at quarter and half rates and full rates of of things like benolate ronalan and so on to try and cut the input costs but to to pattern it or to to, to sort of tailor it to the risk that's there but that was at a time where we really weren't overly concerned about fungicide resistance. And I would say nowadays with the improved knowledge that we have, the experience in Europe, the transitioning experience we see in Australia, we might want to be somewhat cautious about those half rates. And if there's a range of rates on the label, yeah, use the lower rate that's there. It's within that label recommended range, um, but perhaps be somewhat cautious and maybe look at products that might be a little older, but still quite effective, uh, and that have a lower price point so that you can try and cut your input costs that, that way. Duane, critical for growers is they're keeping their records to just not track you know, things by product name, for example, but really tracking the active to make sure that they are in that, that proper fungicide rotation, correct? Well, absolutely. So, it, it, you know, we talked about, we all talked about the frac groups. That's, you start with that, you know, are, be very cognizant of the chemistry that you're using. And I, I think all labels, like in Canada as well, right, you have the frac group on, on your labels uh, to notify you which mode of action you're using. Uh, certainly not just using a different mode of action is, is good. You need an efficacious mode of action. So you, you have to know, is it rated well on that disease? Uh, so absolutely, you want to you want to rotate. You want to you want to know what you're using, and uh, even if even if it's only a uh, a once a year application, as we talked about earlier, uh, you know, just rotating from year to year, uh, not necessarily in the season, is is also very effective. You got to realize that pathogen in the soil that overwinters uh, is still there, and uh, you put it, the same selection pressure on it the next year. You're much better off using a different combination. Uh, in alternate years. Okay. Uh, hey, Kelly, I'll throw this one to you. It's sort of like what I asked uh, Colleen earlier, but uh, of a viewer saying, I feel like we're being provided with some conflicting information. Spraying in dry years with low likelihood of major infection has been shown to have positive ROI for many products, but using in those situations when, they are su when there are such few groups, does that not increase cycle use and risk of resistance? Oh, you know, we, we've done fungicide work in cereals since the mid 90s. And, and when we don't have disease development, so it's a dry year, there might be a little bit of spotting in the lower canopy. Uh, invariably, we find little to no benefit. Uh, uh, and, in, and in many cases, the yield response to the check no fungicide, uh, the yields are the same as our fungicide applied. So, uh, you know, my philosophy on it is if there is limited risk there, uh, whether it's because you don't have the inoculum within the field already, or perhaps the weather conditions that you have, or if you're using a variety that has moderate uh, resistance or a high level of resistance, that fungicide applied in that situation is really not of benefit. And, and the concern that I have long term is that we need to manage these products because you continually have re-evaluation of fungicide actives. And currently, Bravo is one chlorothalonil that is being looked at in Europe and in Canada here, 
potentially being taken off the market if it hasn't been already, uh, and reevaluations by our pesticide regulatory agencies. So uh, the other the other thing is if you go back to 2014 in Europe, there were a lot of concerns that the European sort of agencies that looked at pesticide approvals were reevaluating the triazole class, and there was a real concern that we were going to lose the producers there were going to lose the some of the older triazole chemistries, which tended to be quite a workhorse. So I, I think we we want to be cautious about this. And, um, you know, if the risk is low, the level of disease that you see in the crop is low, your, your, your resistance package is better, you probably want to uh, limit your use of a fungicide in that situation because it, it's not going to provide much disease control benefit. And in fact, depending on uh, the yield response, you might be in a net return type of situation. So, uh, but you know, if you start to see that build up, you know, you might then start to see that five to 10% yield increase with a fungicide application when you have maybe low to moderate levels. Once you get to moderate and high, you're in that probably 20 to 40% or even higher if it's stripe rust, let's say in a susceptible wheat variety. Okay, awesome. Uh, Colleen, uh, quickly here, is there somewhere people could print off FRAC code sheets? Yeah, so so FRAC is www.frac.info is, is their website, and that's a, a great place to find all of the, the sheets we talked about with the mode of actions, and they also have a really good um, categorization list for, for the different uh, pathogens as well. So highly encourage everyone to check that site out. And Colleen, what is BSF doing specifically to manage fungicide resistance? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I think you know webinars like this and and the outreach that BSF is doing is is a great uh, great piece. And you know it only works if if everybody's participating. So really grateful for the fact that we had like 400 people on this call today. That's fantastic. Um, the other thing I think with with BSF is we have a really great group of of field staff and. We're out there monitoring the situation with with fungicides, you know, trying to provide our customers with that information, like Kelly said, about assessing risk, using products when there is a benefit, um, and then checking for any issues in the field. And that's a really great feedback loop that we have with our internal RCD colleagues, so we can really work on developing products and innovations that that aren't just for our benefit that really benefit our growers and, and meet those grower challenges. So I think all of that are, are really key pieces and uh, we're, we're gonna keep plugging away at it. And I think we can really uh, impact this fungicide resistance conversation and, and keep things from going the way of herbicides. Great stuff. Uh, our goal is to provide you with information that helps you move your operation forward. We'd like to hear what you thought of today's webinar and would appreciate if you could take a minute to answer the brief survey question you'll see when you exit today's webinar. And once again, for those of you who are certified crop advisors and or certified crop science consultants, you're el eligible to receive one CU credit for attending this webinar. If you registered an earlier date and forgot to provide your number, please contact Ag Solutions Customer Care. Shortly after this webinar, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording. You'll also post, well, sorry, we'll also post our questions and answers from the session today with the link provided. Keep your eyes on your inbox for that communication. For any additional questions that weren't answered today, talk to your trusted BSF Ag Solutions rep or call Ag Solutions Customer Care at 877-371-2273 to learn more. Thank you again for attending today's webinar. We wish you all the best in the coming season. Sean Haney from Real Agriculture signing off uh, on behalf of myself and all the panelists. Have a great spring, everybody.